Okay, so we have um, we have a lot of information in this, and I know you want to leave some time for questions, so I may skip over a couple of slides. And, and the purpose of this is really just to give you um, a, a high-level look at um, the work that we've done over the past year or so uh, to develop this Arctic Observations Assessment Framework. Um, <clears throat> so jump right, jumping right in, um, the, the task uh, given to us, um, and we collaborated on this um, with SEON, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the other partners that were involved, um, was uh, to come up with a, a societal benefit framework um, that could serve uh, as a top-down approach, I guess would be the best way to think about it, um, for identifying what um, were the critical parts of a Pan-Arctic observing system. Um, and you can see from the slide, there are a number, uh, that's been called out in a number of places uh, as um, an activity um, to be carried out. So uh, after the, the White House Science Ministerial, um, one of the uh, deliverables that was identified was um, the desire to develop a, a framework um, we were uh, tasked to partner with SEON in order to uh, hold a workshop and develop that framework. So there, there are three phases to this to the framework development. Phase one is that the actual development of the draft, top, what we call the top of the framework, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, phase two is, uh, is, a, is being piloted right now um, in, in different places, and we can, we'll update you on what's going on there. And, and that's really to identify key information products services or research outcomes that um, connect to the societal benefit framework um, and ultimately can be mapped down to um, the observation systems, networks, and data that are used uh, by those products. Um, and that's done in phase three, uh, where we actually talk to experts that produce some of these information products or, uh, or research products uh, about what um, what systems and networks they rely on, uh, and we can also evaluate things like the, the relative impact of those individual systems on some of the objectives that are described in the framework. So uh, just to acknowledge um, some of the help that we had with this, uh, so SEON was a, a key partner, um, helped us to identify, both frame the approach and then come up with a workshop shop organizing committee, um, had a, a, a wide range of partners, and you can see uh, some of the organizations listed there on on the right um, and ultimately the, the workshop uh, had attendees from uh, a pretty um, reasonable uh, um, international community uh, international uh, flavor to it so you can see all the countries there that were that were represented at the workshop workshop attendance was not the only opportunity folks had to um, review and contribute we also had a, an external review process where people who we're not able to attend the workshop, we're given the opportunity to review and provide some input to this framework. So um, what is this, right? We identified these three phases. The first phase is identifying uh, societal benefit areas that are specific to the Arctic. Um, this builds off a uh, methodology um, that our organization um, used um, for uh, OSTP and the US Group on Earth Observations to conduct the 2016 Earth Observation Assessment, and it, it utilizes a societal benefit value tree uh, as an organizing principle to identify what observations are used to contribute to those objectives. So the first part of this is to describe, in this case, uh, consensus international objectives specific to the Arctic uh, that rely on Earth observations. And I think that's an important piece because there may be some objectives that have, are very societally relevant and important, but they don't necessarily rely on Earth observations um, uh, to achieve them. And we're not looking for those, we're looking for things that are specifically linked to, um, to Earth observation. As I mentioned, phase two is the identification of those information products, and, and phase three is um, linking those products uh, down to the Earth observing systems and, and identifying um, and determining the relative criticality of, of each of those. Um, so framework development was um, carried out in a couple of steps. Um, first of all, the, we, we utilize the value tree framework, as I mentioned. This relies on expert domain knowledge to develop this hierarchical framework. We start off with um, a benefit area, uh, which are broad domains, and then um, narrow that down to thematic areas. Um, and the idea here is, to, is to, to establish that connection between societal benefit and the Earth observing input down at the bottom here. Um, so beginning in August, we, uh, we developed a draft framework. That framework was derived from um, international 
strategy documents. So we had 25 international strategy documents that were identified, 16 different countries in the European Union. And these strategy documents um, had a variety of goals, objectives, and activities listed in them. We pulled all of those in, did, um, did an analysis, and, and this was with the help of the workshop organizing committee to, uh, to describe um, and identify societal benefit areas and an initial set of objectives. So basically a draft of the top part of this tree, societal benefit area, sub area, and key objective. Um, we then um, socialized that at a workshop in January that was hosted uh, at NSF. And um, the groups broke out and worked on a variety of uh, different societal benefit areas and reviewed the draft, uh, revised the draft, and then actually started to frame the scope of, of each of these societal benefit areas and the objective. Um, the next step then was to finalize that, and that has since been published. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and what we have going on right now is the development of the framework, some several efforts to develop the framework uh, for parts of the value tree below the key objective level. So the workshop developed down to the key objective level. Now we're working on identifying information products um, and groups of products that would feed uh, those objectives. So this is very much, as you can see, this is a top-down effort to get to those Earth-observing inputs. So uh, for those that are interested, and I think this, is, and this has been posted on the IARPIC site as well, um, it was uh, the, the the framework is actually a document that was published, um, and it's available for download. Um, Sam has been hosting uh, the, the public link to that, um, but if, I'm happy to, to send out a copy. If you also search the IAPRIC collaboration site, you can find it there. Um, the, the purpose of this document is to provide um, a common framework for folks who are working in the Arctic and interested in the, Ar in the Arctic and Arctic observations uh, to, to link and map those observations to that single framework. So any um, group or organization or country could take part or all of this framework and start to identify what observations um, they use or they believe are critical to achieve those objectives um, and then assign value to them. Um, the idea being that we have a common framework, we use a, a relatively common methodology to collect the information and then that information can be shared uh, broadly. It's a, it's a little bit um, daunting for any single group to take this on. So um, the idea that you can cut up pieces of this and have focus areas, I think, is, is fairly attractive. Um, so there, let's talk about the framework here. Uh, there are 12 societal benefit areas. Um, these on the slide here, you can see they've been mapped to the, the geo societal, the nine geo societal benefit areas. There are a few that are uh, very Arctic specific, for example, uh, Four is fundamental understanding of Arctic systems. So this is a very research-oriented uh, societal benefit area. We have resilient communities and then social, sociocultural services and weather and climate. These don't aren't a one-for-one -one map with the geosocial benefit areas, but you can see that uh, many of these other topics are. And again, this the purpose of this was to be an Arctic-specific um, societal benefit framework. Uh, we wound up with 12 SBAs. Each of those SBAs are are broken out into a, a set of um, sub areas or uh, discrete domains, um, topic areas within the domain, and there are 41 of those, 164 total objectives. And the, the goal here was to capture both research objectives in the Arctic and operational or service-oriented objectives, and you can see the breakdown there. Um, just as an example of what this actually looks like, uh, this is from the Environmental Quality SBA, and this is part of what the phase one output looks like. So we have the sub areas of, uh, are listed on the left, and we have each of the key objectives, and in this case there's, there's four or five um, identified in, under each of those. And you can see I highlighted, for example, manage regional and local human activities in the Arctic to mitigate environmental impact is an example of a more operational oriented objective, whereas understand the impact of pollutants on the energy balance and effects of the cryosphere is a more research oriented objective, and they're both represented in here. What is in the full report uh, is um, a description of the scope of each of the aspects of the value tree. So societal benefit area, the sub areas, and the key objectives each have some descriptive text that goes along with them so you understand what the scope of these things uh, are meant to be and what types of observations and data products might be used to achieve some of these objectives. Um, that is fundamentally 
phase one in the top of the value tree. Um, and what's being worked on now uh, are, as I, as I mentioned, are a couple of efforts, pilot efforts, to work on phase two. And this is where you can take a sub area, an entire societal benefit area, or even a single key objective and identify a, represent, a representative set of key products, uh, services, or research outcomes that might be used to achieve those objectives. The important thing here, and there's, here's a couple of examples uh, of the types of things that you might identify as what we would call a KPSO. So uh, one could, example could be a report, another example could be a set of, a map or a set of maps. Um, the key thing here is that these products use earth observing systems uh, to develop the product. And what we're looking for primarily here are not um, expert user uh, data sets or, or data sets themselves, we're actually looking for end user products. So something that uh, someone could pick up and actually apply to a decision-making process. Um, <clears throat> phase three is where you actually talk to the folks who produce these products uh, to understand what earth observing inputs they rely on um, and the relative criticality of each of those inputs. Um, and you can see here, uh, we have a full value tree for, for one particular key objective from marine and coastal ecosystem processes, societal benefit area, mapped all the way down to um, the input level. And this is just an example. You can see this is the type of information that we get. So A, you know what inputs there are, are being used, and you also know how important relative to the producer of the product each of those inputs are. Um, you can also look at performance of those inputs as well. Um, all right, let's jump ahead. So the, um, and again, you can see the top-down nature of this to get from societal benefit down to the, the uh, observing inputs. So how do, what do we do with this once this is done? What are the application of the complete assessment results? So phase one um, gives you this, this framework, and it's a common cross-cutting set of international service operational and research objectives in the Arctic. So it provides a common language for people to talk about societal benefit in the con specifically in the context of the Arctic, uh, with the notion that all of the objectives identified in the framework can be specifically linked to uh, some set of earth observing inputs uh, that are required to achieve those objectives. Um, phase two is this initial mapping of information products. So this allows you to identify, are, A, are there information, end user information products out there that can be used to inform decisions and achieve some of these objectives? Uh, or, or are we missing things? Do we only have expert user products, for example, or data sets? And some of that is in process, in progress. Um, phase two is also the first level of output that you can actually use to identify the most relied upon information products. And again, those information gaps that might be associated with a Pan-Arctic observation system. And then finally, in, in phase three, the first step of phase three, there are several steps, uh, is where you identify an unranked list of inputs. So what are the actual, what is the actual list of inputs that we use to, to produce the products and achieve the objectives in the framework? and it is specific to this framework. So it actually um, provides justification for, I know that, that um, synthetic aperture radar is very important to a particular application in the Arctic, but this allows you to show where else that is used and build the case for exactly how important that particular observation is. Um, some of the phase two activities that are planned or underway are listed here. Uh, so, so Finland has taken over uh, chairmanship of the Arctic Council, um, and via um, AMAP, they are considering um, a proposal to take on the meteorological products and observations associated with uh, the um, Arctic observation framework. So it would be looking across the entire value tree specifically to identify uh, meteorological project products and then the observations that contribute to those products and anywhere those products would fit in across the value tree. So this is a component uh, of completing phase two. Um, there's also uh, um, the IMOBAR project um, that the Joint Research Center uh, Euro of the European Commission is taking on. And this is um, specifically a, a benefit cost study where they are using the value tree framework that the international value tree framework that was produced as the baseline for defining the benefits. Um, and Jason and I are, are interacting with those folks. Um, I think we're going to be in Brussels in November to specifically talk with them about the methodology 
for how those benefits are described and identified. So that's a, that's a major piece there, I think, um, in terms of um, a contribution. And then finally, we've been working um, with Sandy uh, um, and, and some of her folks on a couple of different things, but right now we're focused on um, identification of sea ice products that are information products that uh, are potentially applicable to a variety of different aspects of the value tree. So the first step for us has been identifying those products. Um, and, and part of that is also to help Sandy uh, and her folks um, describe and identify uh, essential sea ice variables and, and where those variables map to some of these information products uh, and, and where we don't have products that, uh, that represent some of those. Um, let me show you an example of how we think this societal benefit framework approach can be applied to some, things, some of the things that you may be more familiar with. So here is just a screen grab from uh, the GOOSE effort, the Global Ocean Observing uh, effort to map um, benefits down through the central ocean variables and the, and the data and data products that feed those. And I've overlaid where the different parts of the value tree match up with what they've done. So you can see the SBAs and sub areas are at the top. We have key objectives, which sort of describe the societal benefits that are delivered. What we call product groups are those applications. And then the phenomena are where the would be captured in the individual products. The essential ocean variable layer here is, is something that we don't capture, but we also are looking at those inputs. So uh, one of the things that we're starting to do, and this is just a, a, a draft example with not real things in here, but it's, it's meant to be um, uh, as an example of what how we might put this, this together. Some of the things that we've been doing with Sandy's group is identifying KPSOs and KPSO groups. And so, for example, you might have an Arctic sea ice minimum product, uh, a daily sea ice analysis product or set of products, and a sea ice outlook product or set of products. Um, these would be linked, and I've put essential sea ice variables in here, um, to, to different um, types of sea ice, essential sea ice variables that might be represented in those products. Um, and in this case, those are just a pass through to what we would be collecting and looking for, which would be different observation inputs that feed that product layer. Um, so this is how we would look at this. Um, I think one of the, through our conversations with Sandy, I think we, we understand a little bit better how uh, she might be looking at this. So we view our observational inputs here on the left as directly linked to the products. So those observational inputs feed the products. Um, however, the products are also linked to and contain essential sea ice variables. So we're, we're viewing this product layer as the pass-through um, that, that can potentially help identify essential sea ice variables in this case and where they're being picked up and where there are actually products that are um, capturing those things um, or where there are gaps. And then for our purposes, what are the observational inputs that feed those KPSOs? So, so you know what observations are currently providing information um, to inform those essential sea ice variables. So I will stop here. I think I ran a little bit long, but I wanna um, give some time for questions.